As, as I mentioned um, in our opening prayer this morning, we will have communion uh, following the teaching, so I will provide time for that, which means uh, we will probably spend at least two Sundays in chapter five of Revelation, this one and next one at the very least, and perhaps a third, depending on uh, how the Lord leads. Um, I have been um, really blessed with some of the commentaries and some of the teachings I've listened to, uh, and there's just so much in this chapter. Uh, and just so we all understand the flow of the book of Revelation, as we've come to chapter 4, verse 1, we enter now into the third and final section of the book, and, and that carries us straight through to the end of chapter 22, and that is John is writing now of things that are yet to come. So these, all these things that we're, we're reading and, and looking at now are things that are yet future from our vantage point in time, and we yet await these things to be filled. I believe John, as he was invited by the Lord to come up to heaven in the very start of chapter 4, he is a, uh, or within John is a picture of the church being taken up to heaven uh, just preceding the time of Jacob's trouble, which is to try the whole earth, which then come in chapter 6 through until the end of chapter 18, beginning of chapter 19. So chapters four and five is this incredibly heavenly vision. John is there in heaven. When we get to chapter five today, and we're gonna start it, we're not gonna finish it, uh, we're gonna see he's still there around the throne of God. And the previous chapter, we saw God the Father and also God the Holy Spirit will be noted. Here in this chapter, the focal point turns from God the Father to God the Son, and he's represented as a lamb that was slain. He's also represented as a lion of the tribe of Judah. We also see the Holy Spirit in this chapter. So we have the Trinity um, coming forth off the pages of chapters four and five in both cases. And we look further into the details of this incredible experience that John had when he was caught up to heaven to see the throne room of heaven. And so we look further now in chapter 5, verse 1. It says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? No man in heaven nor in earth neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And we'll stop there um, for a few minutes. So first things, we want to notice the word and. The very first word of this chapter is and. It's a conjunction. It's connecting uh, the, the first verse of this chapter with everything that was said previously in chapter 4. In other words, the chapter breaks in your Bible and mine were not inserted by the Holy Spirit. We have to understand that. Um, this was uh, originally written in scroll form. And the ancient scrolls, and this is important information and it's pertinent to our time in the text today, the ancient scrolls, they were assembled side by side, page by page, and they would roll from from left to right, or depending on the language, right to left, which, whichever direction they read, but they would roll in this direction. So the left hand would be winding up and the right hand would be unrolling and, and then it would come to pass. Now, later on, they took those scrolls and they cut them in, into sections and then they became codexes and they would stack them like this and such, now we have books that are bound like this. But prior to books being bound like this, they were scrolls like this and the text was like this joined together and then they would roll them through and they would read them as they'd roll them, unroll and roll back up. So as soon as you were done reading something, it would get immediately rolled back up into the scroll. Much easier is our method, of course, because you can just skip to anywhere in the document without having to unroll the whole thing to get to it, right? So we, we, we're very thankful for the development of certain techniques technologies in, in the world. Um, now we don't even need to flip anything. We can swipe uh, or we can just, hit, we can just, you know, search within a document to find the exact place and jump there. So, you know, the advancements are, are, are far beyond what we're talking about here in the book of Revelation. But this word and connects the previous chapter to this chapter. We're still in the throne room of heaven 
And we're still looking at the throne of heaven and all the things that are around it. So we're remembering with, with us we take chapter 4. God the Father seated on the throne. And there he was displayed in all his glory. And John did his best to use human language to describe the eternal and the infinite. And of course, human, langu human language is finite. It's limited, extremely limited. It doesn't matter what language you speak, what your mother tongue is. And by the way, uh, I just want to say it is so cool from my vantage point uh, on Sundays and Wednesdays when I look out at our church to see the very many uh, different kinds of cultures and tongues and places that are represented in this, in this place. It is such a glorious expression of really uh, the body of Christ, globally speaking. That, that you know, it, I, I'm, I was saved in Calvary Chapel when I was 17, and it just, that was just my church. I thought all churches outside of the Catholic Church were actually like Calvary Chapel. That's how naive I was. I thought all churches, people would bring their Bibles to church to study them from cover to cover. I thought that's just what church was. That's, that's the church I got saved in. So that's just what I assumed, but I was wrong. Be that as it may, it doesn't mean Calvary Chapel is the only church. God forbid. Right? You know, there's not going to be a Baptist in heaven. There's not going to be a Presbyterian in heaven. There's not going to be a Lutheran in heaven. There's not going to be a Catholic in heaven. There's not going to be a Calvary Chapelite in heaven. There's just going to be born again, blood bought Christians from every tribe, tongue, and nation in heaven. And I love how we see this in our church. I really do. Um, it wasn't my idea, by the way. I've shared many times when I came to Finland, my heart was to plant a church that was going to be for Finns. And, and of course, there's one big problem with that. I don't speak Finnish, uh, but my wife is a Finn. So our plan was to just have the, 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 have the services trans. She would translate for me. And so thereby, we'd, we'd be able to have, you know, it would be taught in English, but translated simultaneously. And then so, so we'd be able to reach Finland. But, but as such, uh, the Lord had different plans. He brought Finnish speaking Finns and Swedish speaking Finns. So why would we translate just for the Finnish speaking Finns and then not worry about the Swedish speaking Finns? It kind of seemed a little bit wrong. All spoke English. So they just said, let's just do it in English. We don't need translation at all. So, okay, fine. That, that, gets my wife off the hook. Uh, I, would, I would feel very bad for her to have to translate for me because back in those earlier, earlier days, if you think my Bible studies are long now, <laughs> I, the earlier days, man, they were, they were, they were longer, much longer. So um, God really uh, spared my wife a lot of suffering. Um, but uh, be that as it may, because we basically start from the very start of our church function in English, it just it, it brought it brought people who are here from all different places that can function in English. And it was just became how the, the Lord did what he did. It was not our plan or our, our idea. The Lord just did it. And so I am very blessed. And, and that again, that is very pertinent to this chapter we're going to see, because that phrase, every tribe, tongue and nation is actually in this chapter. Um, and, and he is the one who has redeemed us all unto himself. And we are all underneath the banner of his love and his redemption. So we, we praise him for that. And this heavenly scene that's before us that we carry over from chapter 4 and is the word that connects it. And he says, and I saw, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Now, we understand that God is spirit, right? So what does it mean that John saw the hand of God here? Right, Because in the previous chapter, there was no such physical description of God given. What John described in the previous chapter was like the emanating glory from the throne. It was just so glorious to look upon that he could only talk about an emerald rainbow that was radiating forth from around the throne. He talked about the four living creatures that were surrounding the throne and the 24 elders and their thrones that were around the throne in this this sea of crystal glass that was surrounding the throne and all these glorious things to depict really the amazing radiating glory of God. Um, but he did not give any kind of physical presence as such. And here he does, which I find fascinating. I mean, he saw a hand and, and, and this was the hand of the one that sat upon the throne. And by the way, it's not just any hand, right? It is the right hand. Doesn't it say it there? I saw in the right hand, and in fact, the, the proper way of translating that would be upon the right hand, because the word in Greek is epi. It is not en. Uh, it's not inside. It's upon. So th the Greek word tells us that this was 
this scroll, this book, as it's said in our translations, but it's actually a scroll, was upon the hand of God. Now, it's funny because, you know, scholars, they, they like to split frog hairs. And that is a ridiculous expression because frogs don't have hair. So in other words, they talk about things that really don't matter and they're, and they're not really there in the text. And some try to say, well, what is this? This is a little bit crazy because th there couldn't be a, a book on top of the hand of God. It would fall off. I mean, it, they, they say all sorts of crazy things. It's like, do you not think that God, he says he has you in his hand. If he can hold you, he's not worried about a book falling off his hand. This book is securely held by God because it is something that is dear to him. And it's in his right hand, I believe, because it speaks to the point, in fact, that this book belongs to his son, Jesus Christ. Because we know that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he ascended and was seated at the right hand of God. The right hand is the hand of authority, of power. And, uh, you know, it is that expression of almightiness. And, and so in this right hand of God, as John sees it, he says that there is this scroll, this book. And then it says, written within and on the back side, which is unusual. Now, you guys know what that's like when you write on a piece of paper and you run out of room. And so you have to flip it over to write on the back. Some commentators will express their opinion about this, that that's what they think happened. That there was so much detail that was expressed within this scroll that an, an unusual thing was done because they never wrote on the back of scrolls. They never did. The, 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 the papyri that they used to make these, uh, or actually leather before papyri, they would put th these things on. They would be, they would be kind of shaped like the scroll this way. So it would be almost impossible to kind of read from the back and, and work that scroll from the back. So anyway, some, some believe that this was because there's so much detail and the comprehensiveness of what's being communicated in this scroll was so great that they had to, you know, ran out of room and had to go on the back side. Um, perhaps, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily see it like that. I think what was in the scroll, as we just read in verses one through four, because none was worthy to open it and read what the contents that were in it, but the writing that was on the outside could be easily seen. And I believe the outside was there describing who was worthy. Because it's not about who is willing to open up this scroll. It's about who is worthy. It's not about who wants to open up this scroll. It's about who has the right to open up this scroll. It speaks of somebody who has the worthiness and the authority to open it. I believe that's what was marked on this outside portion of the scroll. It wasn't that they ran out of room. By the way, I was reading one commentator and they said that the book of Revelation as it would be written out, because um, the, the, the sheets that they would stitch together to roll, they were about uh, eight centimeters wide, roughly. And uh, the book of Revelation as it would have been written out and put in these little scrolls, would have been 8.5 meters long, something, something like that. So in its entirety, just the book of Revelation. So you can imagine how cumbersome this was to carry your Bible to church. If you had all 66 books with you, man, that would be a nightmare. Um, but I think this, is, this book that was written within and on the outside um, it is telling us that there is one on the outside. This is meant for this individual and this individual only, or this kind of individual and this kind of individual only to open. I believe that's what it is. Now, you guys are all asking, well, what is the scroll? What does it mean? And again, the scholars, there's a lot of sanctified speculation on this. Um, I believe it has an answer. I believe it's a biblical answer, actually. Um, and I'll tell you what, what I think it is. And, and there's a lot of scholars that agree with me, but there's also a lot of scholars that disagree with me. And by the way, when I speak of scholars, I do not include myself in that group. Um, but I can read them and uh, I can learn from them. So there are some that believe that this described in the scroll is a bill of divorcement of God from Israel. I believe that's nonsense. I don't believe God will ever divorce himself from his chosen people, Israel. I believe Israel are still his chosen people and ever will be. And he is just working out his plan. And one day, as it says in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, all of Israel shall be saved. I believe God is going to do that one day. Because I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I really do. 
and I take it from I take it from face value where it's meant to be. There are figures of speech and metaphors and idioms and, and all those things we take into account because linguistics do come into play with our interpretation. But generally speaking, read it and take it at face value. It's as simple as that. God says what he means and he means what he says. It's just like that. So I don't think this is the bill of divorce uh, of God towards his people Israel. This may be, as some say, because it says it's sealed with seven seals. In ancient Roman culture, Vespasian and Augustus both practiced this, that their will was sealed with seven seals. So some like to try to draw the connection from the Bible and biblical expression to secular, um, and we might even say pagan kind of practice, to seal a will and testament with seven seals because a couple emperors in Rome practiced that. I mean, I mean, I would much rather try to find an analogy that would help us understand this that's going on here in chapter five of Revelation from the Old Testament. I think better not, not to look out to the world to give us an understanding of what's being expressed here in type or in uh, kind of a metaphor or an idiom or whatever, uh, but let's look to the Bible itself to find within, within the realm of, of the people of God and how God desires to function amongst his people. So what I personally believe that this scroll is, and there's other descriptions that, that, that you can find, other, other ideas of what this is, but this is what I believe. I believe it is the title deed to the earth. I believe that in this scroll, God the Father has given the right to ownership of all that there is in all of creation to his son, Jesus Christ. And of course, we understand that God is the creator of all because we just read that in the previous chapter. He is the creator God of the universe. So all is underneath his supreme and ultimate authority. And he is ultimately the owner of everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the Psalms describe to us. The earth does belong to the Lord, but something horrible happened in the Garden of Eden. If you go back to the book of Genesis in the very first chapters, in fact, if you just look chapter one in verses um, 26, there it says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And listen, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over, the, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, God gave man dominion even over the creeps. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, I've created all this and ultimately it all belongs to me. And we recognize that. But God did something amazing here. He said, I'm giving it to you, man. I'm going to let you have what I've just made. And he gives the world to man. That man would have dominion over everything, even the creepy things. Everything. But what happened? What happened? Man fell, didn't he? And he forfeited his right to rule as God meant him to rule on this earth. Satan came to Eve and tempted her in the garden. God had warned, hey, the day that you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. And Satan came and said, has God really said that? You won't surely die. God's just worried that you're going to become like him if you partake of this, because then if you eat of this, you will have knowledge of good and evil like God, and you will become a God. He's just worried. He's, he's afraid that you're going to get too big, and he won't be able to keep you under anymore. It's good. Look, it's good. Just take of it. And, and, and Eve took of it, presented it to her husband. He took of it, and the fall of man ensued. Sin entered into this world and everything from that moment on, man and all creation has been under a horrible black curse. And ultimately that the curse is seen in death because the day you eat, you shall surely die. What was the death? 
that Adam died the day that he partook of the forbidden tree, it wasn't a physical death, was it? In so many ways, it was a spiritual death. Yes, from that moment on, Adam began to die physically as well, but he didn't die immediately. But what did die immediately was his connection with God, right? That connection with God, that fellowship with Adam that God had in the garden before the fall was broken, forever broken. And as Adam is our federal head, as we are in Adam in that sense, because all have come from Adam and Eve, right? I mean, I hope this is, this is Bible 101 stuff. We did not evolve, okay? That's why, you know, this whole, all the, all the racial divides and, and issues we have around the world, they're nonsense. When we talk about race, I don't like that. There aren't many races in my mind because we are all of one blood. We all stem from the same original parents. We, we all have the human genome. We've been created in the likeness and image of God. And really this issue of, of skin colors is not an issue of skin color, but it's an issue of sin. That's what it is. People just having an issue of, and being divisive with certain people of different looks, it's ridiculous. Because we're, we're all from one blood. Ad, Adam and Eve, especially Adam, he's known as our federal head in theology. In him, we are in the sense that we all inherited a sinful nature. We inherited that fallenness, and consequently, we are under the curse of death, and we need redemption. The world also, it's under the curse of death, and it needs redemption, and it needs redemption. So since that day that man fell, he relinquished his right. He, rel he said to that, to that deed that God gave him this world, he says, I don't want it, God. I want what Satan has to offer me. And he gave up his right to the world, to the devil. And ever since that moment, the devil has been the God of this world. Little g God. Okay, please understand. Because ultimately God, he rules over all. But for God's purposes and his intents and his divine eternal plan, he's allowing this. It's in his sovereign plan. But nevertheless, since that moment, Satan has become the God, little g, of this world. And that's just not, that's not my phraseology. That's the Bible's phrase. If you look in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says this, speaking of Satan, in whom the God of this world, these are Paul the Apostle's words here, as he's, as he's, as he's guided by the Holy Spirit to write, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. This is a very interesting thing to consider. It almost sounds wrong to say, but we remember as we get through uh, into the gospels a bit in, in, in the book of Matthew in chapter 4, the temptation of our Lord. It says there in, in Matthew chapter 4, it says that Jesus was led up onto an exceedingly high place and Satan had him look out at all the kings of the world and he said bow down to me Jesus and I and I will give you all of these kingdoms you see all that dominion I have I will give it to you Jesus just bow down to me and of course we know that Jesus he rebuked Satan by saying get thee hence Satan for it is written thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve but listen Jesus never disputed Satan's claim to ownership of all the dominion in the world. He didn't dispute it. He acknowledged it as a fact, but he would never bow down. Because he knows ultimately one day, God the Father was going to give him this scroll that we see in Revelation chapter 5. And he would take it back. And the world will be redeemed unto himself and it'll also be gifted back to man to whom it was originally intended to go to in its proper place and order. And so as you look through the Bible, you see clearly Satan is called the God of this world. Jesus in Gospel, Gospel of John, John chapter 12, 14 and 16, Jesus calls him the prince of this world. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, you have there a phrase, prince 
and power of the air. Where is air? In this world, where can you find air? Everywhere. Satan is the prince and power of the air. Everywhere is his dominion, presently. Presently. Look it. Go and read the news. <laughs> this is not the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Right? We understand that. It is the rule of the devil and man influenced by the devil. We see it so clearly. People living for darkness, people living for self, ruling for power and wealth. This is what the world is presently and has been ever since the fall. So when you look at Genesis chapter 1, you see the world belongs to man as God gifted it to us. Genesis 2, 7 tells us that man will be under the curse if he sins against God, and he was. Genesis 3, 17 tells us the ground will be under the curse if man would disobey God and bring in death and sin to the world. Genesis 3, 18 tells us the plants, the very plants that we try to grow and live off for sustenance are cursed. And then also Genesis 3.14, the animals. It, and that's an interesting one because we miss it. It's subtle. Genesis 3.14 says this, and behold, uh, uh, excuse me, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. We tend to only focus on the curse of the serpent because he goes on to say, um, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of life. He, he describes the curse, right, to the serpent. But notice the language here. You are cursed above all the cattle and all the other beasts. In other words, the, the cattle and all the other beasts are also cursed. So the animal kingdom as well, the whole entire world is under the curse, and it needs, and listen, it needs and it awaits redemption as well. If we turn with me to Romans, and, and you'll, you can read it for yourself. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 23. And I love this verse, verse 18. That's why I just included it in there because it's so encouraging to understand that what we experience now, the troubles we experience, Right now in this life, we should not let them get us down too much. We might, we might want to say at all, but that's a little bit, that's, I think that's a, a high bar to set. But we should not let the things of this world that are difficult to get us down too much because there is an incredible amount of glory that will one day be revealed in us. Look at what it says. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And then he goes on to kind of give some uh, further explanation. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to the curse, or vanity, my translation, unwillingly. In other words, the curse fell upon nature because of what man did, not because of what nature did. That's, that's, what's, that's what's coming down here in this verse. That the, the curse received, uh, that, excuse me, the cre creature received the, the curse, not willingly, but unwillingly. Uh, and of course, it also is waiting in hope, verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Isn't that unbelievable that the creation we're told is groaning because it knows it's not what it ought to be it is also subject to the curse and it's awaiting its redemption one day verse 21 because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of the corruption one day if you turn with me to um Ephesians chapter 1, we have, we, we looked at this actually on Wednesday. By the way, on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have a Bible study every week here. And um, 
currently I'm teaching through the book of Jeremiah, but there are other teachers in this church that are teaching through other books on Wednesday as well. Uh, Andreas is taking us through the book of Ephesians, and of course, uh, Oli is taking us through Numbers in the Old Testament. So come on out for that, if you will, uh, 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary every week. But Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says this. It's a beautiful passage. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So there's this idea of redemption, right? We have been redeemed from sin and death. The blood of Christ has cleansed us. If, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've placed your trust in him for salvation, you've repented of your sins, you have been washed in the blood of Christ and redeemed by his blood unto himself. You're saved, but there is yet expressions of redemption that will one day be fulfilled. And, and if we just talk about our bodies, right? Our bodies are still under the curse. Oh, fellowship for us has been restored to God. We can personally know him now because that broken fellowship which came when Adam sinned has been restored because of the finished work of Christ. But our bodies yet await redemption. Every, every day I wake up, I'm reminded my body <laughs> is under the curse still. I will one day experience, though, redemption. That my, my body will be raised from the dead one day and fitted for heaven. This corruptible will one day put on incorruptible. That's what we're told in Corinthians. So th there's this incredible thing that Paul mentions here in Ephesians chapter 1, though, where he talks that the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a seal, which he calls in verse 14, the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So what does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit has been granted to every child of God. He indwells every believer as the token of belonging to God. In other words, it's like God stamped his name on you. You haven't arrived in heaven yet. You haven't yet reached that place of complete perfection because salvation is threefold. It is past, present, and it is future. You have been saved. You are being saved. You will yet be saved. That's, that's the salvation that's included when you come to Christ in repentance and faith. And we, those that have been saved, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. And if you have been saved from the penalty of sin, currently, presently, you are being saved from the power of sin so that you can walk with the Lord without sin interrupting and impeding that fellowship with God. But one day in the future, you will be saved from the very presence of sin because you will be in heaven. And until that day, until the redemption of his purchased possession, which is you, he has given you a mark to remind you, you belong to me and I am going to complete the work which I began in you. You're coming home. So all of this language, all of this redemptive language speaks to us, going back to Revelation chapter 5 now, please, I'm already out of time. It speaks to us, I believe this scroll speaks to us of the title deed of the earth because as I explained, God, he created man, and then he said, I'm going to give you this world that I've just made. Look at all, you know, man was the last thing he created. He created everything for, with man in mind. And then he placed man in the garden and, and then he told man, it's yours. Have dominion. He forfeited that right. He gave that title deed over to the devil, as it were. But Christ has redeemed it back unto himself. And the book of Revelation is the story of how it will all be brought back to the way it was meant to be. We see in the book of Revelation the judgments that will be poured out upon Christ and God-rejecting world from chapter 6 to the end of chapter 18. And then, gloriously, 19 till the end of the book, give us the coming of our Lord back to this world and the setting up of his millennial kingdom on this world where we will rule and reign with him 
in a world that is restored to its intended place. So this is yet to come. But there is only one that can make it happen. And when you go into all of the Levitical laws concerning the redemption of possession and property in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 25 especially, you will see there that God, he has said that this land, it belongs to me forever and you are not to sell it to anyone. And if, he says, because as you know, when the Israelites got into the promised land, God divided up the land by tribe and by family, right? So every single family in the whole nation of Israel had a piece of property, had a piece of property. Imagine that. Imagine God bringing you to a place where, you know, they were probably, you know, a few million as they came into the promised land. And imagine we as, as God's people, we, we, we traverse, you know, for many years in, in the desert and finally we arrive to this promised destination and then we find out, oh man, we're all going to get a piece of property? This is great. We're all going to have our own place to live with our families. And that place of property, that piece of ground, that dirt is going to be mine. And God says, listen, if you run into a problem and you can't pay your bills, or maybe there's been a drought and you can't grow crops and you can't feed your family and you need money and you're in desperate straits and something has happened, you can forfeit your right to your land. You could hand it over to somebody else for a price. You could sell it. But, but, guess what happened? Every 50th year, the year of Jubilee would happen. And God said that original owner is to receive what rightfully belongs to him. His land is to be returned to him the year of Jubilee. This is a picture for us, when you go and look at the laws of redemption of land and property in Leviticus, it tells us that, yeah, land that was given to certain individuals could have been forfeited, especially if they came into dire straits and they needed something in the moment. They could have sold it. But even if they did that, it was always to be returned to its original owner because God says, above all, I am forever the owner of this land. And this is how it's supposed to be. These laws of redemption existed. We have images of this in Leviticus, but then we actually see it practically carried out in the book of Ruth, don't we? Where Boaz is the goel in the Hebrew, the kinsman redeemer. And he goes and he takes Mahlon's land back unto the family to which it belongs. And he redeems it as the Goel, as the kinsman redeemer. He redeems it back into its rightful ownership, its rightful place. And he restores things to the way it's meant to be. We see this also in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32. In fact, this upcoming Wednesday, believe it or not, just so happens to be this upcoming Wednesday, we're studying Jeremiah chapter 32. We will see Jeremiah instructed by God to buy a piece of land, which not long from the moment which Jeremiah stood was going to go into 70 years of captivity under Babylon. Why, God, would you want me to buy such a piece of land? I'm going to have to be giving it over to Babylon for 70 years. Why would I buy it now? It's not a really good time to invest, God. But he really knew it was the Lord because the Lord confirmed it to him, so he does it. And he wrote a title deed out. And he brought their witnesses to observe the whole transaction and he bought this piece of land and redeemed it back into himself to his family for himself for his family in the future and he wrote it out he rolled it up and then there was a second document that described I believe who was able to open up the title deed we see this picture in Jeremiah 32, I believe what's described to us here. There in Je Jeremiah 32, we see two documents, one rolled up and, and then one open-faced piece of document that was buried in the earth. And that open-faced piece of document should describe who was allowed to open up the title deed and possess the land that it belonged to. Here in the book of Revelation, we see a book, a scroll, the title deed of the world that is rolled up, written within, we can't see that, but written without as well, describing who is worthy to open, who has the right to open the seals of such a document as this. Look, 
the exclamation from the angel says here in verse 2, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And it says there in verse 3, no man in heaven or in earth, celestial, terrestrial, neither under the earth, we're talking about like Hades now, <laughs> was able to open the book neither to look thereon. This is so important to understand, folks. There is no man that can redeem himself, let alone the world. And by the way, when you get to the end of this cha chapter, you will see hundreds of millions upon millions of saints in heaven glorifying and worshiping the Lamb who is on the throne. Okay? And amongst all of those hundreds of millions, there was none worthy. Not even those glorious creatures, the cherub and the seraphim, no one in heaven, in heaven, in earth, or below the earth was found worthy. Maybe there were many willing. You know, I'm, 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 I'm sure that Klaus Schwab would lo love to have the title deed of the world. <laughs> I, I'm sure that, you know, Bill Gates would love to as well. I'm sure that, you know, my, my, my government in America would love to have the title deed of the world, and China would love to have it, and Russia would love to have it, but those are all wants and willings, but not rights. There is no one, no one, that has the right to ownership of the world except Christ. And God the Father is going to extend his hand. We're going to see this. This is a vision of heaven, something yet to come. We are there. We are amongst the hundreds of millions that are witnessing this account where God the Father extends his right hand to his son. It says there was none worthy, so John wept. Why did he weep? Did, did you ever have something withheld from you, some information that you really wanted to know? And maybe, you know, I just want to know what, what's written therein or what's behind this. I need to know. I need to find out. And it was more like a carnal desire. You really didn't need to know. But you were just tantalized about what could it be on the other side. So you had to find out. Am I the only one or what? You know, I guess so. I'm the only one that feels like that sometimes. But this is not what John felt. This is not what John felt at all. There was nothing tantalizing about this or, ooh, wow, this is going to be awesome because I'll be able to re re return to my body back on Patmos. I'll be released and I'll be able to tell the church of all the things I sell, so, saw in heaven and then I'll sell my tapes and make millions. No, it's, it's not. It's that, this is, there's, no, there's nothing selfish here. There's nothing self-seeking. He's weeping because he understood if none are found worthy to open this scroll, then the world will go on indefinitely in the state that we find it in presently. And he was like, no, it must be redeemed. Where is the redemption of God? Where is the one that's able to open the scroll and break these seven seals? And he's weeping because he wants to see the redemptive purposes of God carried out to their end. And he doesn't see it presently. There's someone missing from the scene. But then one of the elders says unto him, don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Redemption is found in Christ, John. Weep not. Weep not. The world has been redeemed back unto its rightful owner and will be executed that title deed will be executed one day practically and we will witness it take we will see it with our eyes it'll all take place right before us but there is one who is worthy there is one and only one who can redeem and it is to him that we are thankful for all that we have because he has redeemed us unto himself and made us partakers of this glorious scene that we will be within one day. We'll have to wait until next week to actually look at this lion of the tribe of Judah. But for now, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this, your word to us. And we praise you <clears throat> for being our Goel, for being our kinsman redeemer, as it were. Lord, we aren't necessarily 
to think of ourselves as something special because you redeemed us. Oh, Lord, I know that we are special to you. But Lord, we know within ourselves that there is nothing that we have done that could possibly be deemed worthy enough to redeem us back into yourself, let alone to redeem this world to its rightful owner. So, because we find ourselves in such straits, Lord, we are so thankful that your, your word tells us that we have, we have been reconciled to God by our Redeemer, the one who does have the right, the one who does have the authority and the power to come and take us back into himself. And Lord, you paid the price of redemption. And that was your blood. We exchange money for property, but you exchange your life's blood for us. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you so much for the work of redemption you accomplished on your cross of Calvary. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.